Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rock Point. We're so excited that you came this morning. We're so happy to have you. It's a beautiful day in the presence of God, even if it's not a beautiful day outside. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, if you're new here or you're at least relatively new, my name's Thomas, and I'm the youth and young adults pastor here at Rock Point. Pastors Jeff and Karen Wells, our senior pastors, are not with us this morning because they are in their homeland of Canada ministering to some churches there. So they send their love and their greetings. They miss you. They, they really don't like being gone. They love this house. How many of you love our pastors? Amen? I want to say a special hello, good morning, and greetings to those of you joining us on live stream this morning. And just make a quick announcement. That is that today, uh, at the end of service, we will be taking communion. And so as you came in, you should have been offered or maybe have seen the communion pieces. That way you can have those for when that time comes. If you haven't uh, grabbed one of those, if you didn't get one, if you missed it, you, you can raise your hand. We'll have an usher find you and, and bring you some. Or you can go ahead and sneak out at some point and grab those pieces in the lobby. Well, I'm so excited this morning to be with you. It's a beautiful day. Again, even if it's a little wet outside, but guess what? Today marks 19 weeks for my soon-to-be son that is in that woman right there. She's 19 weeks along. We are so excited, and we're going through all of the big motions uh, that comes with pregnancy, um, from ultrasounds to, and, and feeling the baby move and all the diet cravings and all the different things. We're so excited. 19 weeks is big. I mean, we're almost halfway there. And it is so hard to say the words halfway there without singing. Yes, exactly. You feel me. <laughs> We're almost halfway there. We're going through the motions. There's all kinds of, of things that we do when you're going to have a baby. And one of those things is a baby shower. And a baby shower is a lot of fun if you're connected to a community that can um, bless you and shower you with gifts. Now, as adults, we get this concept and we get this title, right? But I can remember as a very young man, um, my brother and I are about seven years apart, and I can't remember if it was when he was to be born or my sister, which is only about a year and a half, two years later. But I remember very vividly being in the front seat of the car with my dad as we were driving to pick up my mom for, from her baby shower. And I knew the baby was still in my mom's belly. And so I was so confused as I asked my dad, how are they showering the child before it's been born? <laughs> I couldn't, it didn't click. Like, why, also, like, why do, why do we invite people to do that? That's so strange. Why is everyone watching this kid get bathed? Also, how come the baby isn't taking a bath and it's taking a shower? Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? The, the term, it got lost on me as a young man. And finally, I, I realized later that we're showering the the, the mother with, with gifts. That makes sense. Now, i got to be honest. When it comes to cleanliness, um, I think it's really weird when adults rely on baths rather than showers. I just, it's a, an opinion. Don't, don't, don't yell at me. Um, I'm not a bath guy. Now, I understand some people enjoy bath to read a book or whatever, but like when it comes to cleanliness, it seems kind of disgusting. That's just my opinion. I do... I do participate in, in, in some baths, like a, an Epsom salt soak. Have you ever taken an Epsom salt soak, right? It's meant to be relaxing, but also it really helps with recovery. Now, we're pretty physically active. Um, I, last year, actually almost a year ago, I had a group of the guys come down to the church, and we spent most of a Saturday morning uh, just destroying our own bodies. Jack's head just went down in his hand. It was a lot of fun, right? It's a time of bonding, but... I have a pretty busy life. I believe in, in, in physical activity, athleticism, but I don't have the, the space in my schedule to be as consistent as I'd like to be, okay? Um, that, that a normal fitness trainer would teach you, you know, a little bit every day. So instead, I just do a ton in one day to make up for it, okay? Now, my body is acclimated. Now, when I say a ton, I mean like the three to four hours straight of like sprints and plyometric, all kinds of stuff. And so I like to do a group workout. Now, what I incorporated into my lifestyle um, to help with the recovery because what you'll find is when you take your body to that brink, the next day you feel like you got hit by a train, <laughs> okay? What I've incorporated in my life is not just an Epsom salt soak, but an ice bath. Has anyone here ever taken an ice bath? 
Okay, a couple of you. Let me tell you, it's not the funnest experience, <laughs> okay? So some people have designated tubs for this, um, but what we do is simply I run cold, the coldest water I can in my tub, and then I take giant bowls of ice and put it in, and then I get in. And you sit for 15 minutes at least, right? Now, ideally, you want to get your heart, your chest under the water too, no matter what it is you're trying to recover. Um, because the idea is that the ice restricts the blood flow and that when you heat back up, the, it, it releases different chemicals and, and it cleanses your blood and it helps speed up recovery. And it actually, it works really well. But the process of getting in the ice, right now it might not sound that difficult, but when you put that toe in... <laughs> The game changes, okay? It gets very difficult. My wife has an aversion to pain. I love her dearly, but she doesn't like to be uncomfortable, right, Melissa? Yes. Now, now you might say, well, most of us don't like to be uncomfortable. I'm talking like next level, okay? So she hates, she hates being sore, but she also hates doing things that'll keep her from being sore. And so throughout our marriage, there has been times I've convinced her, I've coerced her, well, you should ice your legs so that you can... Uh, recover faster so that we can do this again sooner. And uh, I, I, although it, I can't, like the belly is really hard to get under the ice water, okay? But I can get my legs in pretty fine and just do one of these, you know, and just kind of shake. If you, if you want an interesting task, go home today and just Google or YouTube people getting in ice baths. It's hilarious, okay? Um, one of them that would be a, a, a highly viewed is if I was to record Melissa getting an ice, in an ice bath, okay? Because... Uh, there's a 15-minute soak, but with Melissa soaks, I have to include the 20 minutes it takes for me to convince her to get under the water, okay? Because she'll kind of like just freeze hovering over, the, hovering over the tub, and then she'll be like, every inch that goes under, she'll go, ah! Ah! right? As she slowly dips her body into this cold water, this, this soak, this plunge, this Bath. And we're going to read some scriptures this morning out of Acts chapter 8, verse 36 through 38 in the New King James Version. But before I do, let me give you a little context. Here we see the disciple Philip. And Philip is sent by an angel of the Lord to meet the treasure, treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority representing the queen, returning from Jerusalem in his carriage, reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And God says, or the, through the angel, go speak to that man. Now, what, what Scripture tells us is that this carriage is, is moving. And so to get this picture, Philip is practicing some exercise himself, right? So in obedience to what the angel is saying, Philip is running beside this carriage, right? And it says that Philip is running beside the carriage, and the guy's reading out loud from the book of Isaiah. And Philip's like, hey, what you reading? And the guy's like, well, oh, Isaiah? He's like, do, do you know what it says? And, 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 the guy, and the eunuch just simply says, well, how can I? And then someone explains it to me. Anybody ever feel that way when you read your Bible? <laughs> I do, and you're ashamed to answer, but I, I know everybody goes through this, right? That I need, some, I need some explanation. I need some interpretation. And that's where we pick up in verse 36 in the New King James Version. It says, now as they went, or, or sorry, from that point on, Philip picked up in Isaiah. He explained what Isaiah was saying, and he tied it into the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he explained the life, the message, and the acts of Jesus Christ. And it says, now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. This morning, I want to talk to you from the title, The Plunge. If you're taking notes this morning, my title is The Plunge. This morning, I want to talk to you about this concept, this practice, this idea of baptism. The word baptism in the Greek is baptizo, which means to wash, immerse, submerge, or plunge. Again, my title this morning is The Plunge. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for these moments that we share together. Lord, I thank you for each and every life represented here in this room as we have demonstrated a willingness and, and, and an eagerness to come together in community, to worship you, to learn more about you, to glean from your word. And Lord, I pray that this morning that you would use me as your vessel. We thank you that your word is alive and it's powerful. Father, give me the words to speak. 
Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. Open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to what you have to say to us. Let your word be like a good seed planted in our heart to produce good fruit. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Now, baptism. We have a lot of new people in our congregation. There's been some turnover in, in kind of the post-COVID era, right? So maybe you're fairly new to church, or maybe you've just never really um, had a, a, a rundown on the doctrine of baptism. But most people recognize baptism as the religious practice of public immersion in water. But maybe you've wondered what this strange practice really is and why we do it. I reference that we're going to have our third child. That's because we have two others. And I, every time I preach, I, uh, I bring them up. We have Hannah and Adeline. And they are very, very different in personality, especially when it comes to their conscience and obedience. Okay? Now, Hannah is a good girl, but she is also a little bit of a, a I don't want to say free spirit. That's too much of a negative connotation. But she's just, she's got a strong will, okay? Whereas Adeline is uh, very much, she's more submissive and obedient. Okay, let's just say it plainly. She's obedient. <laughs> and, I, and it's so nice, okay? It's so nice. It actually was nice to get the more difficult child first and then because we were braced for the same level of difficulty uh, with Adeline. But she has been relatively easy thus far. Her conscience is so strong that recently my daughter Hannah has learned to read. She just finished first grade. She's reading very well. And oftentimes she'll read things to Adeline and show her, hey, this is what this means. So one day they're playing outside on their scooters and their helmet says something and I can't remember what it is. But Hannah reads it to her. And so Adeline comes in and recites it to us. And she says, mom, this says this. And she goes, I read it. And we just kind of go, oh, okay, yeah, that's cute, that's funny, right? And she goes to bed, and everybody kind of celebrates, no big deal. Days later, days later, I, I don't even know, three days later, we're putting Adeline to bed. Mom and Dad, I'm so sorry, but I didn't read the helmet. I just copied Hannah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and she cries in repentance because... She, she knew that it wasn't true. Now, she didn't really do anything wrong. She was just told that she read it, she, so she repeated it. But that's just one glimpse. So more recently, I, I have an aunt. She's probably tuned in or will tune in later. My Aunt Michelle. And she is that blessed aunt who always brings a bunch of sugar to my house, okay? Now, we're not an anti-sugar family, but we're also not insane. Uh, we, we, I don't need my kids to have sugar all the time. But she, like, goes overboard. She'll call and say, what do the kids want? And then she'll bring twice as much. And it's stuff that I can't get rid of until her next visit. It's insane. And so uh, one of the times she came down, and we left the kids with her for a while. And I think I had instructed the kids, hey, we're done with treats for the day. Uh, but this is before she got there, before my aunt had got there and had known. While we're gone, my aunt takes the kids to the drive through at Dairy Queen. Okay, awesome treat, cool aunt move. They get ice cream. But my, my youngest, my <laughs> Hannah's just like, yeah, this is delicious, and just totally forgets about what I said, right? But Adeline is holding the ice cream and bawling, absolutely in tears, won't eat it, because she says, I just don't want my dad to get mad at me, right? And it's precious, and of course I didn't get mad at her. What my, what my aunt said at the time over, overruled, and it's okay. But my daughter, Adeline, has such a, a deep reverence for what I say to do. And the first reason that I want to bring to our attention, and probably one of the most important reasons that we believe in the doctrine and the practice of baptism, is very simply this. It's a command. Baptism is what we would refer to as an ordinance, which means order. It's a divine requirement, not a suggestion. Are you with me? In Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 38, we see the Apostle Peter at Pentecost. And he's preaching, and, and the people are responding to the word. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 38 in the ESV. It says, Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. This is Peter sharing the gospel with the people. And he said, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What's our response? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. It's not considerate. It's not think about it. Be 
baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to stop right there and go on a little bit of a tangent because there can be kind of some controversy about this particular piece of baptism and the tying of salvation to baptism. Can you be saved without being baptized? Yes. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that he is our Lord, that we will be saved. Okay? Even with the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip's response to him was, if you believe in your heart, you can be baptized. Okay? If you believe and you confess. So belief came before baptism. Can you be saved without being baptized? Yes. But should you be saved without being baptized? No. Baptism is not essential to salvation, but is also never presented as an option. Credit Pastor Josh Jin for that verbiage there. They complement each other. They are mutually inclusive. It should never be a question of, should I get baptized? But a question of, when shall I be baptized? Are you with me? Baptism is a command. And if the words of Peter aren't enough for you, let's look at the words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, where we find the Great Commission... And often focus, and rightfully, emphasize, emphasize and focus on the going portion of the Great Commission. Here's what Jesus says. This is, after, this is post-death, resurrection, right before the ascension. Jesus came and told the disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you even to the end of the age. Here, Jesus gives this command and shows that baptism itself is a key in discipleship and being a follower of Jesus. And at the end of the day, aren't we just followers of Jesus? And as followers of Jesus, followers of Jesus, a command that Jesus himself has given us is to be Baptized. He even set the example by being baptized himself. The ultimate precedent. The ultimate precedent. As a parent, I, I realize, and if you're a parent, or, ha, or well, in the case you can't have been a parent, but if you are a parent, you, you understand that there, you are responsible for setting the ultimate precedent in your home. Okay? So, with my daughters, oftentimes they uh, squabble, we'll call it, okay? And <clears throat> not that they're uh, bad kids, but sometimes it turns into name-calling and maybe throwing some fists, okay? And they, they, they will say things to each other that are mean and hurtful. And of course, we correct them. We say, hey, don't, don't call people dumb. Don't call people stupid. It's not kind, okay? And man, do I look so so holy in that moment? And then do I feel so silly when I'm in the car and we're on a drive and I'm like, that idiot just cut me off. And from the back seat I hear, we don't say idiot. <laughs> and so I'll be like, every, every time, oh gosh, that was so stupid. We don't say stupid, okay? <laughs> I am held accountable to the ultimate precedent that I as a parent set. Are you with me? And Jesus himself set the ultimate precedent for baptism. And we find this in Matthew chapter 3. We're going to read a couple of the portions of this scripture. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, In those days John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jump down to verses 5 and 6. It says this. People from Jerusalem and from all over Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. And then finally, verses 13 through 17 says this. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it, which is normal. Okay, I would, I would do the same. I think most of us would. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God re 
choirs. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. When we go back to verse 15, it said, But Jesus said, It should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. When you study the language here, we see that it is a divine imperative. It's a command not only to us, given by Jesus, but to Jesus, given by God. Are you with me? Jesus set the example. The ultimate precedent. He himself being baptized. Each gospel records this event in one way or the other. Think about this. Oftentimes we, we, we tie baptism to salvation as a means of, of being forgiven and, and washed clean of our sins. Jesus needed to be baptized. Jesus was sinless. Jesus, perfect, sinless, was baptized. In fact, the Gospels don't record Jesus' earthly ministry until that moment. Jesus' ministry, the impact that he had on this world, most of the, of the parables and the scriptures that we're going to teach from wasn't recorded until this happened, until Jesus himself was baptized. Let me give you a very simple principle in Christianity. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you. If Jesus did it, so should we. Are you with me? Amen. We're to be Christ-likes, followers of Jesus. We copy the ultimate precedent. Jesus said it. There are prerequisites in life. And most of us know that. Maybe in your field, maybe in your education or your career, whatever it is. In some of the, the hobbies and things that I enjoy, there are very obvious and clear prerequisites. There, there was the time where American Idol was a, a giant hit. And people love American Idol not because so much that the, of the good voices, that it was mostly a, a ratings hit because of the bad voices, right? Now, many people uh, are under the illusion that they are better singers than they are. But it's not actually limited to just singing. Hey, I'm a musician, and I have met many musicians who thought they were a little further along than they are. They thought, hey, I memorized lyrics to Taylor Swift, or I can sound on pitch with Hillsong when the recording's on, so therefore I should be a worship leader. But they didn't have the prerequisites, okay? They have no understanding of, of tempo, of, of keys, and, and how music works, how the, the, the music structure works. Are you with me? You can relate this to any walk of life. I, I, I have a combat sports background. I'm, I love jujitsu and other combat sports. And each combat sports I, I participated in, you go to those class, classes, rather, it's not going to be everyone together. You're going to have a beginner's or a fundamentals class, and then you're going to have an advanced class. Okay? Now, time and time again, at the advanced class, we have seen people come in and want to skip their prerequisites, whether it be ex-military or bodybuilders or people from other, or, uh, other um, martial arts. And every time they leave, humiliated, because they don't understand the fundamentals. They don't have their prerequisites down. Are you with me? Baptism is a prerequisite to the fullness of what God has for you. It is a prerequisite to the fullness of Jesus' ministry. And if Jesus did it, so should we. Still with me? Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 refers to baptism as a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. In short, fundies. That's what we call it. Okay? Fundies. It's the fundamentals. How many of you have ever heard the term basics win championships? Right? Basics win championships. In life and in Christianity, the, we have to get to the beautiful basics. And baptism is basic, but it's powerful. It's also a response. Baptism is a response. I'm, a, I'm not a manners Nazi, but I would say I'm a manners guy, okay? I like pleases and thank yous. Um, when I'm at a restaurant, I have a pet peeve, and I've told the youth group about this. Um, my pet peeve is if I, it's not, it's not just that people say please, but if it's that if I say thank you, you say you're welcome. Yeah. So I'm not like a, uh, on the Enneagram, I'm not even near, okay, maybe I am. I, I'm not an eight. I'm not a challenger, so I'm not one to usually, uh, to, to 
to, to pick fights with strangers, especially in customer service. But there is one thing that absolutely gets under my skin. And that is when, I'm, I'm, when, a, when a server is doing their job and I'll be like, thanks. Hey, thank you. Thanks. No response. So as they, as, after like the third time, I'll always be like, I'm welcome. I'm welcome. <laughs> because to me, there are certain things in life that demand a specific, certain, and appropriate response. Are you with me? I'm a moviegoer. I like going to the movies, okay? When I go to the movie, this has happened to me several times. Maybe you can identify with me. Sometimes you go to the movie, and you'll scan your ticket, or you'll buy your ticket, and the, the, the poor and, and awesome, not like poor in money, but like the, the, you know, the hardworking um, worker will say, enjoy the show, and I'll be like, you too. <laughs> They're not enjoying the show. <laughs> they're going to keep their, they're going to sit there scanning tickets. And I feel so silly. Why? Because it wasn't the proper response, right? It was like this canned, like, routine. I just said what came off the hip. It wasn't the right response. So you wait, walk away feeling like a doofus. Or, or here's this one. How's it going? The proper response would be good. Okay, or the average normal response. If you're not good, I don't encourage you to say good if it's not going good. Or, or a little bit more modern, uh, hey, what's up? The response would usually be, not much, nothing. Yeah, okay. Have you, <laughs> what's up? How, how many of you have ever been in this one? What's up? Good. <laughs> How's it going? Nothing. <laughs> how many of you ever flip-flopped that, right? Like, or, or here's one for you. Like, I, I used to say this, that you get this gre greeting and you don't really know how to respond. Howdy. Good. <laughs> howdy. Nothing. Like, I, I think the only way to, to respond to howdy is howdy. <laughs> right? You know, howdy, partner. There are some things in life that require a specific response, an appropriate response. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, this is also in the story of Peter preaching at Pentecost. It says this. So those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that about 3,000 souls. Okay? The response to the gospel of Jesus Christ, when Peter preached it to these people, the response, the appropriate, the needed response was baptism. Are you with me? When we go back to this first text that we read with Philip and, and the eunuch, and Philip's getting his jog in, and he's, and he's interpreting Isaiah, and he gives the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the eunuch says what? He, he stops and he says, there's water. Why can't I be baptized now? Because there is a response. There is an appropriate response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is, and one of them is rather, the act, the ordinance of baptism. Are you with me? Baptism is a statement. In the I iconic and American treasure that is the sitcom The Office. And if you disagree with me, you can leave. I'm just kidding. I love The Office, okay? In, in the show The Office, the, the, the primary character played by Steve Carell, his name is Michael Scott. He's going through some financial trouble, and he is destitute with debt, okay, tons of debt, and he is bebopping around the office, and he gets advice from the, 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 the worst guy you could get it from, which is Creed Bratton, and Creed is a little office rocker in the show. If you've seen it, you'll be familiar, and Creed tells Michael, well, just go bankrupt, man. It's a fresh, clean start, and Michael says, Creed, bankruptcy can't be in the option. If you do that in Monopoly, you lose, <laughs> Which just shows you Michael's character, okay? And this shows you Creed's character. Because Creed's response is, you can't go life by that game, man. You don't get out of jail free cards for $100. Those things cost thousands. <laughs> Delusional, the both of them. <laughs> but Michael's response to that is, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. And so Michael chooses, because all he were, heard was Creed says, you should declare bankruptcy. So he's in the break room at this moment with just... Oscar and Creed, and I'm not a fan. Anyway, he walks out into the lobby, into the bullpen where everybody's working, and with his, mu he just musters up just all the courage he can. He goes, I declare bankruptcy! 
because he thought that's what it meant because he was declaring it, right? <laughs> and he just yells and everybody's like, okay. A few minutes later, one of his trusted advisors comes in and goes, did you know that just saying you declare bankruptcy doesn't mean it worked, right? And he goes, I didn't say it, I declared it. <laughs> and he, he totally missed the right See, he's not stating it the right way. It wasn't the right statement. At another episode, there's this episode where D Dwight, the assistant to the regional manager, okay, he, he does some very, very silly things, okay? And he is told as part of his reprobation and, and, is that he has to apologize, that he has to write a statement of regret, which implies, hey, there's going to be some heartfelt apology, uh, you know, it's going to be engaging. And so Dwight gets up, all somber as can be. He takes out his little note, and he says, I state my regret. He folds it and puts it away. And everybody gets so upset because it was the wrong statement. That is not what we were looking for. Baptism is a statement. It's a public response to a personal decision. A declaration of allegiance. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28 says this. For you are children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ. Like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Baptism is a public statement to the private decision. But it's like putting on a team jersey that says, I'm all in. Scripture says we're not to be ashamed of the gospel. And there is something proclaiming. There is something definitive. There is something bold about standing in front of your peers and even strangers and saying, I am all in for team Jesus. Are you with me? It's a public statement. Before we moved here, we lived in Eugene for a little while, and I did some scaffolding. And uh, I'm not a construction guy, uh, but scaffolding is a lot of just grunt work. It was long hours. And uh, I, we would wear these high-vis shirts, okay, like yellow. And they say McKinsey scaffolding. And during that period of my life, I was just incredibly exhausted all the time. Um, there, there was one time I came home, ate dinner, and I laid on the kitchen floor and just fell asleep. It was like 6 o'clock, and I slept in and slept, slept till the next morning. Like, I could not move. I couldn't. And Melissa describes that era of me as McKenzie Tom, okay? Because I was a little bit probably shorter, uh, not in height, but, you know, in patience. <laughs> I didn't grow in the last year, I don't think. Um, but I, 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 I had a certain demeanor about me, and I saved some of those clothes. So we had a, a church work day not long back, and I put on my high-vis McKinsey scaffolding uh, shirt, and Melissa said, McKinsey Tom, right? Because there was something about that shirt, something about that uniform that made her think of me in a certain way. Are you with me? She identified me as a certain person wearing that uniform. And Baptism is a public declaration, a statement saying, I'm on God's team. And I don't care who knows it. Are you with me? It's like a wedding. Making your, a public commitment to your spouse. Now that's not to say that if you have both agreed that you wanted to get married in private, that that's lesser. But what would be weird is if one of you wanted to get married in public and the other one wanted to keep it a secret. Right? Right? That's a huge red flag. <laughs> That's a huge red flag. I'm going to advise you to reconsider that one, okay? We want God to do awesome things in our public life for people to see. But sometimes we don't want to do public things for God. And God has called us one of the first steps in our Christian faith, the fundamental doctrine of baptism, and it's a public statement. We say, I'm all in. Amen? But like a wedding, baptism is also a celebration. Now, there might be some people who go to a wedding and they're not celebrating because they're jealous, but that doesn't fit the illustration, so we're not going to go there. <laughs> a wedding is a celebration. It's your friends, it's your family, it's people coming together saying, Congratulations. We're so happy for you. We're so excited for you. 
to see what's going to happen in your life from this point forward. And that's exactly what baptism is. Are you with me? So here's something crucial you need to catch about the doctrine of baptism. Because so far we've covered the fact that it's a statement. It's a response. It's a command. It's something we have to do. But, but that, is the, that, is the, that is the adolescent way of viewing it. Because it's not just something that we have to do. It's something we get to do. Are you with me? Just like getting married. When you married your spouse, hopefully you weren't thinking, I have to do this. <laughs> and, if, and if you did and you made that covenant, I still believe God can bless that marriage, so don't get all stressed out. But if you haven't got married, don't think that when getting married, okay? You should be excited, saying, I get to marry the love of my life. Are you with me? And baptism is the same thing. It's something that we celebrate with you. We participate with you. We get to celebrate together. In Acts chapter 36, when, when we were looking at the story of the eunuch, he was excited. Here's one of the first ingredients. If you want to be baptized, this is very simple. The eunuch said, hey, there's water. Why can't I be baptized right now? Catch this. This is important if you haven't been, been baptized yet. The first ingredient was desire. He wanted to do it himself. He was not peer pressured by his friends, his family, or his pastor. You with me? Because it's a personal decision in response and obedience, but there should be some, I cannot wait to do this kind of emotions. Are you with me? Because we don't just have to, we get to. It's not just obedience. It is obedience, but it's not just obedience. And finally, baptism is a, is a powerful, symbolic act. If you've been in Christianity or, or, or kind of lived a religious lifestyle, you'll, you'll, you'll come across the term sacrament. We don't, we don't use it too much, more anymore, uh, too much often anymore. But the word sacrament is simply a symbolic act. Act. It's something that we do that's symbolic. It's, an, it's also an ordinance. Those two are usually the same thing. But baptism isn't simply symbolism. Don't miss the word powerful. Here's the thing about Christian sacraments. They're not just symbolism. They're not just dead activities. They are powerful symbolic acts. Are you with me? See, all throughout Scripture, you can find times where God used the medium of water to deliver his people. We see that in the life of Moses. If you look at Exodus chapter 14, we see the, the Exodus, right? When God uses Moses to guide the Israelites out of Egypt, away from the Egyptian slavery, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2 writes about this. It says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground, in the cloud in the sea. All of them were baptized as followers of Moses. We see God was using baptism thousands of years ago, just in a different way. He took his people, passed them through water, and brought them to deliverance on the other side. Are you with me? We see the same thing play out in the, in the story of Noah which can be found in Genesis chapter 6 through 8. In 1 Peter, he writes about this. He says, And the water is a picture of baptism. This is referring to the flood, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now we come to the modern act, the modern sacrament, the modern ordinance of baptism that we practice, that we participate in. And it's powerful because of Jesus. Colossians 2.12 says, For you were raised, sorry, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. It's the acceptance and identification with the saving power of of Christ's sacrificial work on the Christ, cross. 
baptism symbolizes the washing clean of sin and raising to life as a new creation. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5 says, or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we, were jo- we joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we also will be raised to life as he was. There is a beautiful power in what seems like a silly religious act because it's not simply that it is powerful are you with me what scripture is teaching us here is that when we confess our sins to jesus and we repent we die to our sins and in the act of baptism we are buried in the water just as jesus was buried in the tomb But the best part is, he came up out of that grave alive again. And that when we come up out of that water, we are partnering, we are are tying our story to his new life and a new creation. You see where I'm going there? The imagery and act of being buried or immersed in water and rising up symbolically mirrors Christ's death burial, and resurrection. But it's far more than just symbolic. It is powerful. God's empowering grace is present in this act of obedience. There is something powerful that happens in the life of the believer who responds in obedience to the act of baptism. Church, will you stand with me this morning? Maybe you're new here. Or maybe you've yet to give your life to Jesus. The beautiful thing about baptism is tying our story to the story of Jesus. And the fact that Jesus was God's son sent to earth for you. For us to live a perfect, blameless life. But to die. And in his death, in his brutal murder... Bear the weight of every sin that you have ever committed, that I have ever committed. He felt it all in one moment. He died, he was buried, but then he rose again. And when he did, he removed the hold of sin, the condemnation of sin, the hold of the enemy on your life. And when we are baptized, we are We are acknowledging that. And if you're here this morning, if you never even received Jesus, I want to encourage you that Jesus made you on purpose for a purpose. That God loves you so much that our sin separates us from him, but he already paid the price to take away your sin. I want to encourage every, every head bow, every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you've never responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you've never given your life to Jesus and surrender and accepted the forgiveness and the the, the final work on the cross right now with every head bowed, with every eye closed, I want to encourage you, if that's you, and you want to accept Jesus for the first time this morning, would you just raise your hand? Would you be so bold right now? Raise your hand. And for the rest of us, I want to encourage you if you're newer, maybe you've accepted Jesus, but you yet to respond in obedience to baptism. I want to challenge you, take the plunge because it is significantly powerful in your life. You will never be the same. What seems like a regular little dip in the water is not. God uses it to do a mighty work in your life life. In just a moment, I'm going to have Pastor Joe come up. And as we've used these terms, ordinance and sacrament, maybe many of us in this room have already been baptized and you thought, well, 
It's a good reminder, but it's not quite for me. I want I wanted to end this way on purpose this morning, and that is in a time of communion. Because it's another ordinance, it's another sacrament, it's another powerful and symbolic act that we all get to participate in. As we identify with Christ's powerful and final work on the cross. Pastor Joe.